Hello and welcome to the Commonweal Policy Podcast. I'm Craig Dale, I'm the Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal. And this week I'm joined by writer, broadcaster, author Billy Kay to discuss the politics of the Scots language. Billy is the author of the book Scots, A Mother Tongue, which was first published in 1986, was revised in 2006, and an audio book read by Billy was released in 2021. I have to say I, I devoured that book uh, as so, almost as soon as it came out very uh, fascinating lesson inspired me to get in contact with Billy to bring him onto the show. Scots is the second largest of Scotland's extant Indigenous tongues, with over one and a half million speakers across Scotland and more in the broader Scots diaspora. Once the primary language of court and law in Scotland, it has been significantly eroded in use and prestige over several centuries, both passively and by acts of deliberate repression. This has taken the language to the point where some either even doubt or actively protest against its existence, either presuming or asserting it to be no more than a vulgar or corrupted form of the Queen's English, with speakers to be corrected of their errors. However, recent years have seen a revival of interest in the language in attempts to catalogue and codify it, to promote it in the public sphere, and most importantly, to speak and write it with the same pride as anyone would with any other language they know. Welcome to the show, Billy. How are you doing? Thank you. Good to talk to you, Craig. So, I, as I say, I was fascinated by by your 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 book on Scots. I, I confess I didn't read it in the the paper form when it came out, but I, um, I did dive into the audio book, and um, it, it taught me a lot about the language that I was brought up in. My, my grandparents spoke Scots, but I, ha- I have lost a lot of it, and I'm trying to rediscover it. Um, so it's been a, a, an interesting personal journey for me. But right. just to kind of start off uh, with that, that assertion that Scots doesn't exist, where, where does that come from? Where, where in linguistics um, does Scots lie on that spectrum of language, dialect and accent? And what is the difference between the three? Well, it's, it's politics really that determine what's a, a language, what's an accent, and what's a dialect. So the same, the same speech form can be literally a language on one side of a river and an uncouth provincial dialect on the other side of a river. For example, that was the case in Franco Spain with Portuguese on one side of the river and uh, the river Minho and uh, Gallego or Galician, regarded as a bastardized form of Spanish by the Spaniards, by the Castellanos, on the other side of the river. So it's, I mean, I, I say in the book that a language is simply a dialect by an army and a navy or a national flag, because that's what determines. In other words, people here in the, our neck of the wood, where there's been a strong tradition of cultural colonization, I would maintain, have this problem with Scots, whether it's a a series of, whether it's a language or a series of dialects, it's actually both. Uh, most people here speak dialects of Scots, mm. but they together make up a language, the Scots language. Uh, a lot of people, another thing that adds to the prestige of Scots that differentiates it from other dialect areas in the United Kingdom, for example, for example, Yorkshire or Lancashire, is that Scots is the the language of a great literature. Name one author like Dunbar, Henderson, Douglas, McDermott in the Yorkshire or Lancashire dialect compared to these great internationally recognised writers in, in Scots. So that's another major difference between Scots and other dialects within the British Isles. So you've got examples like that across Europe of languages which sometimes were the language of state like Scots, then joined with a bigger linguistic group, English, and that eroded them and eroded the confidence of the language speakers. But then you've got other examples of dramatic revivals, for example, in Catalonia, where after Franco died and, and, and autonomy came to Catalonia, the first thing the Catalans did was to uh, 
put money into promoting their language. Mm-hmm. And Catalan's thriving today compared to a, one or two other linguistic minority languages across Europe. So it's a very fluid situation, but basically it's politics that determines what's a language, what's a dialect. For example, no one today would dispute whether a Norwegian, Danish and Swedish are languages because they are spoken in a separate nation state, whereas historically they would have been. The Danes would have regarded Norwegian as an uncouth provincial dialect. And it was only when Norway gained independence in the early 20th century that uh, the language got recognition as Norwegian. And again, they put effort into building up the their language. Uh, and you, the same with Ser- Serbian and Croatian. They are apparently, I don't speak those languages, but they are apparently less differentiated than Scots and English. But again, no one would dream of saying that they are dialects of the same language, for example. Mm, I, I have had the experience of uh, be, being told to specifically to not practice my Croatian uh, in a in a pub because it was mostly Serbs in there and they, they, they may not have taken kindly to it. But that's a can of worms for an entirely new, different podcast. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I, won't, I won't go any further into that. Um, you mentioned that, that 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 languages can become immersed, can become almost assimilated by but by other languages, especially when there is a, a larger neighbour uh, near them. And Scotland has certainly has the the larger neighbour of English next to it. Well, Scots has a has it next to it, and possibly also the additional disadvantage of English being almost a world trade language, a lingua franca, uh, certainly yes. at the moment. How much of the decline in prestige and use in Scots has been a, a matter of passive neglect or the result of that sphere of influence on our border? How much of say, it has been deliberate repression? Well, I would say it was a mixture of all of these factors. Uh, in the book, the podcast, there's some very amusing uh, extracts where a uh, London Scots in the 18th century are brought up and uh, because of the, their speech, because it was it was strange sounding to English people in the metropolis to hear lawyers speaking broad Scots, and there was definitely a feeling of this is where the action is, this is where money is, this is where power and prestige is. Therefore, we should adapt. Uh, there's one or two exceptions to that. There's a, a great story by John Clerk of Pennycook, where he is a young lawyer who has to plead a, a Scots case in the House of Lords, as it was then, about his client's richtig a, a bit of water uh, in a grund that's been belonged to the family for centuries. And he's referring to the water this and the water that, this burn that run through the land. And eventually the English judge, exasperated, said to him, Mr. Clark, do you spell Wata with two T's in Scotland? And Clare, quick as a flash, replied, no, my lord, but we spell manners with two ends. But most folk didn't have that presence of mind. Most folk were like, Boswell, I do indeed come from Scotland, but I cannot help it. And they uh, became sooks and, and su- tried to suppress a part of their identity in order to accommodate the larger neighbour. Now, to make yourself understood is the most natural thing in the world. Uh, I remember I spent a year travelling around the world, and when I came back, I was interviewed for Radio Scotland. And I came back with it, and you can hear the North American twang in my voice because I had spent the previous four or five months in the States or in Canada. Therefore, you adapt. It's, It's a natural thing to do that. But the tragedy of Scotland is that bilingualism never entered people's head. And bilingualism is the path to multilingualism. I'm convinced that I speak several languages, and I speak them well, some of them, because I was brought up bilingual in Scots and English. In other words, the parts of the brain where language is embedded were stimulated by this duality. Stimulated by the fact, too, that you could get the strap, you could get the belt, you could get the toes in lowland Scotland in the 1950s for speaking Scots. 
So, but this gave me a linguistic awareness that people who are monolingual, monoglot, don't have. So later on, when I learned French and German, and then eventually Russian and Portuguese, then it was comparatively easy for me to do that because of that linguistic uh, grounding that I had in a bilingual home environment. So it's tragic that so many teachers didn't have that awareness of bilingualism and thought that by killing off Scots, they would promote English, whereas the opposite would have been the case. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a, a kind of thread we see throughout the book, especially in the, 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 the later part when you're talking about the 19th, 20th and up to the 21st century. Um, I mean, one anecdote that was the moment uh, that I thought I need to get Billy onto the podcast to talk about this was when you were talking about the early days of the Scottish Parliament, when they were mm -hmm. designing the Parliament, really, and they were debating on how much how much language to embed in the signage and the, the the culture of the parliament and it was fairly unanimously agreed that Gaelic should be a part of that um but Scots was fought against can you, can you tell us about about the background of that yeah well there's the, there's that and there's the the debate on on a question in the census which are both very very interesting in a way, eventually, if I eventually bring the book up to date, eh, I would cover some of the, the developments. But I wanted to remind people of how bad it was in the early 2000s, where the Scottish executive, the Labour Party in power at that period, eh, presided over attitudes about Scots. I mean, a couple of examples. Eh, one was uh, someone asking a Labour minister if Scottish history and culture should be taught in the schools. And this woman replied, no, my job's not to bring up a generation of young nationalists. Another one was, this was a minister of culture, and this was my own personal experience, where I asked the minister of culture if he had received an email inviting them to the cross-party group on Scots. The emails were sent out bilingually in Scots and English. And his reply was, oh, that thing in the funny writing, I threw it in the bin. Now, if I had belonged to an ethnic minority, he would never have said anything like that. But they felt justified in disparaging and looking down on the native culture of the, the country they were supposed to be representing. There's another passage there, the Labour MP for Paisley, Hugh Henry, again, who received an email in Scots, and he just ridicules it. And the tragedy there is that uh, Hugh Henry's Paisley was a hotbed of Scots poetry with the radical weavers in the 18th and 19th centuries. So there's an example of an MP who hasn't a clue about the cultural history and the linguistic history of the place he's, represent, the, he's representing. And like that, right across, in the, the debate on the, for the census, there was comedians like uh, Jamie McGregor saying, I'm a firm advocate of the protection of the Scots language. Like Gaelic, its history is timeless and is surrounded by romance. I love the poetry of Burns and McDermott. And then he says, I never go anywhere without my Nicky Tams. Nicky Tams being a popular music hall song about the, the bothy life in the farms. And then Brian Monteith, the Tory, saying, in concluding my speech in the debate on a census question of Scottish language, I feel that it is only right that we say that we're gonna no do that. Again, quoting from a comedy show from the period. Yeah. So if you're a Scottish speaker, and eventually, 10 years later, it was passed and there was a census question, and there are a, at least a million and a half, Scots speakers, imagine hearing your language disparaged like that after working for generations to create a Scottish Parliament, which was my case, and then seeing these total clowns behave like that in the Parliament. Your reference to signage there, that was the corporate body that uh, decided that there would be no signage in Scots within the Parliament. Again, we were allocated a few wee poems on the wall on the outside of the parliament, but nothing was allowed inside the parliament. So the language of 
to say it. One and a half million people, the language of the, the records and the history and the literature going back centuries was excluded basically from the inside of the parliament. Yeah, and um, I'm pleased to see that the, the census that's due to take place this year, uh, was delayed from last year, uh, is going to include questions on Scots again. So the statistician in me that certainly says I'm going to look forward to seeing how, how the numbers have changed uh, will, since 2011. And there was a huge shift in that 10-year period between that period I'm describing and the census of 2011, because only the SNP were for a, a, a question in Scots in 2001, but everyone passed it in 2011. So that shows that some kind of shift had taken place in attitude, eh, or they realised that they couldn't be so politically incorrect and insensitive 10 years later, but it, they all passed the question, and now the, the, it should be established now that there always will be a question in Scots. Yeah, it's amazing how, how things can go from weird and strange to completely normal. Just normal, exactly. Happening. And that's my whole thing about Scottish independence. Within 10 years, everyone would say, this is the most normal thing in the world. How the hell did it take us so long to get there? <laughs> so if we think about the experience that Scots has had in that respect, and then kind of look over at our neighbours around Europe, um, how, how, how does the attitude there to languages compare and contrast? Thinking both of some, the attitude towards what you might call regional and minority languages, like you mentioned Catalan, you've mentioned Occitan, Romance, um, etc. But also maybe some of the, the primary languages in countries that are smaller than Scotland, Icelandic, for instance. How, mm. how, how, do, the, how do these countries and regions um, promote their languages in, in ways that we might not be doing in Scots? Well, I would say the Norse countries, they... They're brilliant linguists. The Dutch are another example of where they know that their languages will never become international lingua franca, that it will mainly be, be spoken by them. And that, but that gave them the urge to learn English and make English their second language and became a lingua franca. And they're all brilliant English speakers as well. So I think the but that should never be at the expense of their native language. Same with the Faroese. So those are examples of countries promoting their languages. Then you've got other places. I mean, the only place historically is better, a lot better now, but with the, the attitudes of highly centralised and, you know, one way to speak was France after the French Revolution. When, when the French Revolution took place, there were more people spoke a Flemish, Occitan, Basque, Catalan, Breton, etc., etc., than Alsa German and Alsace and Lorraine, than spoke French. So the one a motivating zeal behind the French state was to promote French at the at the cost of what they called regional dialects. So France was highly centralized and and therefore quite hostile to regional variations for a long time, a bit like the United Kingdom, highly centralised. Germany, very, very different because there had been no political centre really until the, the 19th century, you could say, and regional variations were the norm there. A, I mean, Hitler got to power speaking with a strong a Austrian accent, which would not never have happened in Britain with somebody speaking with such a strong regional accent. Swiss Deutsch, Deutsch uh, is considered a, a national variation of German. Platt Deutsch is in a better situation than Scots as far as the media is concerned. There are more broadcasts in low German, Platt Deutsch, than there is a uh, Scots. So it just depends. Every, every, every area is different. The EU had a Bureau for Lesser Used Languages, which did very, very good work promoting uh, the, the lesser used languages. And they were exasperated time and time again uh, by the attitude of the British government uh, and by the Scottish executive. I mean, there's examples in the book of where they tried to kid on 
that Scottish Gaelic was Scots to say that they were doing something about it. I mean, absolutely pathetic. So Europe uh, supported regional and minority and suppressed languages in a way that uh, the United Kingdom won't. But then you get the anomaly of things like the Good Friday Agreement, where part of that uh, was an agreement to promote Irish, but then to be shown as even-handed, they also said that they would promote Ulster Scots. So the Ulster Scots dialect of Scots actually gets more funding. Hold on a second. The Ulster Scots dialect of Scots actually gets more funding than native Scots in Scotland because of the, an the anomaly of that political uh, decision to, uh, that came from the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah, the, the the chapter on Ulster Scots in your book was one that I, again, hadn't quite appreciated until I heard it, um, uh, and really brings up the the politics of language in, in that respect. Where while it's not certainly not the only motivation for promoting Ulster Scots, you have British Unionists in um, uh, in Northern Ireland using Ulster Scots as their a pin on their Britishness, whereas you have Scottish Unionists using a rejection of Scots as a pin on their Britishness. Absolutely. The, the worst people online and, and things like Twitter against Scots tend to have a Union Jack and a Rangers supporter identity among them. They are the, the biggest Scots haters that exist in, in Scotland today. So much so that it's, it's just so bizarre because the irony is most of them will speak a form of Scots as their first, as their first language. Uh, a classic example of that was where uh, uh, I was promoting the, the series The Mother Tongue uh, when it was repeated with uh, updates back in, I think it was 2016, and I promoted it on Twitter bilingually again in English and Scots, and I did a, a Scots tweet uh, promoting the series, and one of these uh, loyalist boys with no very much intelligence replied, in English, yeah, who's it? In English, yeah, Tadger. That's what he said to me. <laughs> and you just, <laughs> you just shake your head and think, you know, the the mentality behind that. But in English, yeah, Tadger, he said to me. The boy fee, loyalist, whatever. Now, despite that, one, one of the things I've found in my own personal journey of rediscovering my Scots or trying to, um, has, has been in the internet. Uh, it has been the likes of Michael Dempster and Len Penny and, and yourself, really, to mm -hmm. a great degree. All in, do you think the internet has been a positive and enabling force for for the use of Scots? Definitely, because it's a, it, the colloquial language rather than a formal language is what tends to be used. It tends to be quite a personal medium, whereas previously formal letter writing was a very formal medium. So people are used now to trying to write the way they speak, whereas they wouldn't have in the past. So that's been a great uh, advance, is that kind of democratization, if you like, loosening of the linguistic shackles that the internet has allowed. So I, yes, I, I think that's definitely been a, a big improvement. And a, a lot of a lot of scores is on the internet and, and online, a lot of good stuff on YouTube as well. Certainly, I'm a, a very a small gesture to to to, to my, my Scots. I replaced the the Z in my surname on Twitter with the, the old Scots Yoch. Uh, I saw that. I saw that. Long yeah. live the Yog. The yeah. Yog's Matt, got to come back. Matt so Scotland many, Yoch again. <laughs> there are so many false pronunciations because of the because it looks like a Z. Uh, for example, you know everyone knows Mingus and Menzies, or most people in my generation know it should be pronounced Mingus, but a lot of people spell it because it looks like a Z as Menzies. And Mackenzie gets the same. But for example, when I was growing up in Ayrshire, it was Mackingy or Mackingy it was pronounced because of the, the yog. And then, and very few, every, I think everyone knows the yell is the yog, eh, that it's the y, the y sound. But there's still examples that you come across where people think it's a Z, which it isn't, yeah. 
Yeah, although I do have a namesake uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, uh, a, uh, a DJ who who goes by Delzell. I think a lot of the oh, Ulster Delzells. Ah, right. Uh, I haven't come across Delzell. that. Right. Um, and it was certainly it always caused confusion in my old job when I was working in America. Right. Uh, the Americans could not get their ha ha handle around the idea of a surname that had seven letters in it, but five of them, five of them were silent. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, now, you mentioned a little earlier when you were talking about the promotion of languages around Europe that some of these languages have a, have, have a lot more in the way of media representation than Scots. Scots mm -hmm. in Scotland in the media seems to be kind of relegated to one on and off again column in the national, one newspaper, and the odd bits and pieces from a few broadcasters, especially on radio. Do we need a dedicated Scots language print and broadcasting culture? Well, I would say, especially broadcasting, a print too, but people are used to Scots as an oral medium, whereas unless they have had very special teachers who've introduced them to it, and those teachers exist and they do a fantastic job, but a lot of people are not educated to, be, to, to read Scots, a, whereas they can understand it when it's heard. So I would say the broadcast media are more important. And where Scots is used or bilingualism is used, for example, the, the Scots Awards and the Trad Awards, eh, they had Marianne Kennedy and Gaelic and Ali Heather doing them in Scots recently. And they worked perfectly well. And because they worked so well, you would think that BBC Alapa or the BBC channel would think we should be doing more of this, but they don't because the people who run it don't know the culture. And that's been one of the great problems that I found a, through my years in broadcasting was that often the people who make decisions can absolutely hee-haw about the culture surrounding them. And it's even maybe heightened because the media is based in Glasgow and Glasgow being the big city. In, in Berlin, I, th there's a, I worked in Berlin in the back when I was a German student back in the early 1970s. And they had an expression, something like Grosse Schnauze, meaning big nose, and it described Berliners. Well, you know, Glasgow folk tend to think that if it's no happening in Glasgow, it's no happening and it doesn't exist. And it's Tuchters out in the country that say Stephen and Ken and things like that. And maybe that's one of the reasons why Glasgow-centred media people don't do enough for Scots because they just are unaware of how strong it is 10 miles outside Glasgow, literally. So the, there are these problems. Uh, again, Ali Heather... One of the problems has been every now and again, there are brilliant programmes on Scots, brilliant series on Scots, and then they think that's us done it for another decade and we'll leave it alone. Whereas it should be there, it should, the BBC Charter, for example, refers to promoting Scottish culture well. I'm afraid the record on Scots is abominable. The BBC Channel, uh, BBC Scotland, television channel on Burns Night a couple of weeks ago had their announcements in Scots. They've got a young guy called Dom who comes from Ayrshire and somebody texted me uh, maybe the day before and told me it was happening and he did a great job. It could be done all the time in Scots. It could be a piece of cake but it's just the, it's the fear of the political side of Scots that and that thing about alienating or upsetting people who think that it should be suppressed because it always has been suppressed. I mean, I tell the story in the book of a, a series I made called A Man Good Company, a series of half a dozen interviews back in the early the 1980s, I would imagine, on Radio Scotland. <clears throat> and it was the first time there had been programmes all in Scots at that time. And a uh, Literally, a BBC producer a, who was also well-known in folk circles actually said, and I quote, my mummy told me not to speak that way, so why are we broadcasting in that language? Mm 
And I quote, I wasn't at the meeting. It was a producer's uh, meeting in the BBC. But the producer or I presented that program. The producer was there and he was just flabbergasted. But so you got, uh, then you got other people, you get Gail saying, well, we went through this in the 1960s when we were promoting Gaelic culture. Uh, you got all these people saying it shouldn't be done, but yeah, it should be done because it's part of Scottish culture. So you got a really unusual mixture of, of reactions. Mm. I guess I'm certainly aware of the, the, the fight that Gaelic has had. Um, and, and I definitely don't want to to get into, into a position of a divide and conquer between no. Gaelic and Scots. Definitely. And definitely. One being seen pulling away resources from the other. Yes. Um, what is the state of Scots in modern education? You mentioned decades past you'd have, you'd have got belt it if you were no speaking proper in the, mm -hmm. in the schools. Um, that wasn't it with me in my day, but Scots was still segregated to maybe a few poems, a bit of Burns or a few other poems, an English class. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's, it, what's, it, what's it like right now? And, and should, should we maybe be thinking about teaching Scots as a dedicated language class in schools? Well, that would be, <clears throat> that would be the dream scenario, but we're a long way from that. I mean, when I wrote the, the original edition of The Mother Tongue, I said something like, uh, all the things that could and should be done, but I would settle for one period a week in the schools devoted to Scottish culture. And that's how far we were from it. We're closer now. There are, the, at the Scots Awards, there was an award for schools and for teachers. And there was schools from literally every earth and part of the country that took, took part in it and brilliant uh, teachers doing great work. There's a lot of great publications, Etchy Coo publications, for example, that Matthew Fitt, Dundonian poet, and James Robertson, well-known author, they were behind the Etchy Coo a project and are still producing remarkable books. I bought Grimm's Fairy Tales in Scots and read them to my a, my wee seven-year-old granddaughter Fiona who lives in Brussels so isn't he exposed to much Scots over there a, at, at Christmas time this year and she just lapped up there's an example of where multilingualism <laughs> can just take off a, my granddaughter Fiona and Fabrizio her brother a, they've now got a baby Katerina baby sister Katerina as well they speak Portuguese, they speak French, they speak Italian, they speak English. And now through their grandpa, they're getting Scots as well. And it's a piece of cake too. They can literally, they could, I have that attitude too. They, because of the liberating thing about speaking several languages, you think, well, I could speak any language. And I think I could. I mean, I don't think it's going to happen now that I'm this age. But I always said, a, give me six months in a Chinese immersion class and I'll speak it fluently. And I'm, I'd be confident of doing that because I've got this linguistic confidence. Well, Fiona, Fiona is phenomenal and uh, she'll have that all her life and she will learn another language and it'll be a piece of cake for her because she's hearing them every day in life. I'm reminded of a, a famous Czech proverb, and I've never been able to pronounce it in Czech, but it translates in English as roughly, you live a new life for every language you know. Right, right, great, so, great. Uh, it's uh, one, one for me, who, who I have to confess, I'm not gifted uh, with languages that, that right. uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't taught well to me at school, right. uh, which was the root of it. So I've got a degrade it for my school, so I've got English. Yes. Uh, well, one, one interesting side of that thing about uh, of teaching it in schools yeah. uh, Matthew Fitt gives has given numerous examples of where he's gone into a, a school and he's been warned that uh, you'll get a great response from these clever girls uh, at the core of the, the class but the boys, there's a group of boys who are quite unruly and who will begin to take the mickey and they'll probably be quite obstreperous. The opposite happened mm -hmm. because for the first time ever in their life, the boys had their speech validated. Yes. And it was literally, it was a reversal in roles 
the, the intelligent, bright, bonny quines who were used to being first in the class, this wasn't their language because their parents didn't speak it and didn't encourage it. And therefore, they were second for the first time in their lives. And the boys shot ahead. Now, think of all the recalcitrant boys, teenage boys in classes up and down the country. If they had been, if their culture had been validated, the difference that would have made to all these people. If a concept of bilingualism had existed, what a different, a confident country Scotland would have been in comparison to what it is the new, you know. Mm. So what else could the Scottish government do now to, to restore the prestige of Scots and to help promote the language that maybe you've called for and are not doing? Well, see, I, I personally think that it will take, it'll take independence for things to dramatically improve the confidence that we'll get from being independent. Because until we are independent, all these prejudices and uh, wrong-headed attitudes and media hatred and unionist hatred and all the problems that we know exist with Scots, until we are independent, they will always be there. And any attempt, and we know this, any attempt to promote Scots will, be, will meet with hostile ridiculing in the British media in the newspapers, in articles, in the press, all over the place. So there's, in a way, they're con canny because they don't want, they don't want to be seen as ethnic cultural nationalists. Mm -hmm. And that's ridiculous because, you know, the strength of a lot of people's identities one of, is the reasons they want an independent Scotland. The cultural dimension is the most important thing for me, definitely. But I can see why they are scared of making stronger representation for Scots. And there's always things that they can quote as backing that will say, well, we are doing things for Scots. They're not doing enough for Scots. Of course they're not. Uh, but I can understand why they're not doing it, given the hostile environment they're working in. And to me... I mean, it'll not be utopia after independence, but as far as the culture is concerned, there'll be a lot more confidence of it being Scottish within the culture. Mm -hmm. And if they if they don't want to learn the language, though, then they'll only they know what we're saying about them. So. Correct. <laughs> Good point. So, final question, Billy, as we come to the end of the podcast. What's next for you and your Scots journey? Have you got any projects uh, planned in this sphere uh, in progress? Are we going to get a, another update of the mother tongue in 2026? 2026 post-independence would be perfect, actually. Yeah, it would be. Because then I can say, I can bring the book up to date. Uh, what didn't happen in the intervening years and what has to happen now? that we are independent. I've been waiting on independence like a lot of people. Hey, I'm promoting the audiobook just now because it's it's an old book as far as print is concerned, but it's a new book as far as an audiobook is concerned. So hey, it's great when people put hey, reviews of it onto, onto Audible because it's only by doing that that people realise what's there. So I'm doing that and... Hey, but I'm also doing, for example, this Saturday, I'm doing a big Celtic Connections gig based on the Scottish world. And it'll mainly be in Scots and telling stories about my experience in the Scottish world in Scots with poetry in Scots from South Africa, from America, eh, etc. With, again, one of the great strengths of Scots culture is the song tradition. And I've got Robin Stapleton and Siobhan Miller and Paul McKennick. A singing great Scots songs and it's absolutely wonderful. I was at a rehearsal yesterday in Glasgow for that and uh, it came across very, very well and I'm looking forward to, to joining them on stage at the Mitchell Theatre on, on Saturday. Well, thank you, Billy, for coming onto the podcast. It's been a fascinating conversation with you. Uh, I continue to learn a lot from you. I'll be continuing to, to keep up with your, your work uh, as it 
as it goes on. And I would just like to finish this podcast by reminding everyone, as I do every week, that Commonweal as an organisation is completely funded by our donors and supporters. We don't have government money, we don't get corporate money, we don't even have adverts on our website. So all of our policy work and the podcast and all everything else we do is entirely supported by folk who give us on average £10 a month. So if you can help us out and help sustain our activities, then there will be a donate button in the description of this podcast. And we deeply appreciate any help you can give us. And with that, I'll be returning with the policy podcast once again next week. <laughs> <laughs>